My name is Charles Epting, and you're listening to the Lost Labels Podcast. This is going to be the third part of my look at the Akron sound, the alternative music coming out of Ohio in the uh, late 1970s. And and Chris Butler, I think, um, you know, as much as anybody, is synonymous with, with that musical scene. He was a member of the Numbers Band. He was a member of Tin Huey. And uh, while a member of Tin Huey, he started conceptualizing this group called The Waitresses, who initially were not even a band. It was just a name for the music he was putting out, but eventually morphed and transformed into a, a you know full-fledged uh, rock and roll band um, that had massive success on MTV and on the radio uh, with their with their hit I Know What Boys Like, uh, as well as their uh, classic Christmas song, Christmas Rapping. Um, but apart from that, Chris Butler went on, he... Uh, uh, held the Guinness World Record for the world's longest pop song. He released an album of all songs recorded on different obsolete uh, recording technologies, whether wax cylinder, uh, all the way on up through uh, you know the Rolling Stones mobile unit. Um, Chris Butler is, uh, again, not just an uh, essential part of the Akron sound, um, but to me he's one of the, one of the great, truly original, truly unique, uh, American musicians and songwriters. So I'm really excited to talk to Chris Butler. Um, he warned me in my initial email exchange with him that uh, he has a tendency to be a bit long-winded. So he braced me. He uh, he, he warned me, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait. So before I talk to Chris, just a little bit of quick history. As I mentioned, he was a member of the Numbers Band, 1560-75, uh, alongside Chrissy Hines' brother. Um, but then he went on to join Tin Huey, the great experimental rock band out of Ohio, uh, who released music on Clone Records, Nick Nicholas's label, uh, and did go on to release one full length on a major label on Warner Brothers. Um, but while he was in Tin Huey, he started coming up with this concept of the Waitresses, who released music on the uh, Stiff Records Akron compilation, as well as their own 7-inch on Clone Records. Um, but initially, the Waitresses were not a band, they were um, little more than a, an abstract concept that allowed Chris Butler to release music on his own and to write songs on his own. Um, So that was sort of the genesis of The Waitresses, and and this group um, very quickly transformed and evolved into, um, uh, again, the band that created I Know What Boys Like. Uh, You know, when the band moved to New York and started picking up full-time band members outside of Chris Butler, um, it became a a great staple of 80s new wave, uh, sort of disco-y, alternative rock-y, um, just a, a really wonderful band. They released their full length on Z Records. And um, and again, I, I'm really excited to talk to Chris Butler. There's so many different periods of his career, so many different eras of Chris Butler that are um, so different but also great that this is really an honor and really a pleasure. And uh, and again, there's there's so many different releases, I, you know, not even to mention uh, Chris's work as a producer as well. So I, I think um, there's, there's going to be a lot to go over. Uh, this is, you know, certainly if you've looked at the timestamp, this is the longest episode of the podcast so far, but certainly I think the length is more than justified. Chris, there's a lot of ground I want to cover with you, but I guess it's best to just start at the beginning. What were you listening to as a child? What was the first music you remember that may have had an impact on your uh, career later on in life? Okay. I'm, I'm an old fart. Um, I, uh, remember things like I did see Elvis Presley on, uh, uh, Ed Sullivan. Uh, I would surreptitiously listen to, um, the rock and roll stations in Cleveland. I grew up in Cleveland. Uh, my uh, parents are Italian and Hungarian, but we lived in the Hungarian ghetto. Um, uh, very much, um, uh, you know, ethnic, uh, ethnic upbringing, but rock and roll bit me very, very early. And, um, of course I was frowned on by my folks, but, um, I, I, I remember things like hearing mad daddy being pulled off the air because he used uh, a phrase. He was all, if you know, mad daddy was all, he invented the hipster, you know, rhyming DJ and slang. He said he, one, and then one time he, he kept, he kept getting censored. Uh, because he would get this close to double entendres or single entendres. Well, he finally said, hang loose, mother goose. Your rags dripping tomato juice. Pulled the plug. And um, uh, I did go to my mom and say, uh, uh, you know, I was listening to the radio. And, you know, uh, it, it is, I, I think it's broken. Because uh, then he got pulled and then it was some classical filler thing. So so um, I, I was interested in rock and roll really early on. Um, uh, but uh, I, was, I was also at the era when uh, it was folk music. And I specifically remember... 
seeing one of my um, uh, high school, uh, junior high school crushes um, named Eve Silberbach uh, entertaining our parents playing baritone ukulele. Um, and I thought, this is the lamest goddamn thing I've ever fucking heard. I can do better than this. And so I decided to learn how to play some guitar. So I kind of took folk music lessons, you know, like uh, uh, cowboy chords, uh, a, a lot of Michael Rowe, the boat ashore, and things like that. All right. So, um, but I'm still very much listening to rock and roll. And uh, I, 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 I wound up, um, let's see, what was exactly, at 62, 63, 61, something like that. Um, <clears throat> I just, I, I, I heard something on the radio and said, fuck this, I want to play drums. And so I badgered my uh, parents incessantly and uh, I got a drum kit and I started playing uh, the drums. And, um, you know, I'll play along with the radio. I built myself this ridiculously awful sounding um, hi-fi system where I had this little plastic uh, um, uh, uh, record player, but my uncle worked for uh, an electronics company called Brush, Brush Labs, and um, uh, he would from time to time give me little bits and pieces of stuff, and he gave me a whole box once of these crystal mic uh, capsules. So um, I I took one of these crystal mic capsules and soldered it in, and somehow I, th I had a tape recorder, so I used that as my uh, preamp. And then I went to Olson Electronics, which was this um, uh, electronics company, and for like five bucks they would sell you an 18 inch speaker. And I built a box that I put the speaker in there, and um, I put the <laughs> crystal mic on the little speaker of this plastic thing and, um, uh, you know, pumped it up for an incredible volume and would bash along with this, you know, every time I came back from school. Um, but, you know, I was just, you know, kind of farting around. And then along come the Beatles said, yeah, I thought the Beatles were okay, but my parents liked the Beatles. So, you know, you can't really, you know, I, you know but I'm, I'm listening to black radio stations and, um, there was a radio station in Cleveland called WJMO, which was the black station. And my first concert was sneaking away, um, telling my parents we was going to a high school football game. And me and my buddy went to see James Brown at the, at the Cleveland uh, arena. And we were the only white kids there and it was fabulous. Okay. But then my downfall started, uh, when I saw the who on shindig. And you had your nice little Beatles and all of this. And then these motherfuckers are on and they didn't break anything, but they were so awkward looking and tough and mean and uh, um, uh, uh, punkish. And I just thought, and this music was sensational. And the drummer was mad crazy. And we all thought, my God, there's a girl. There's a girl playing drums because he looked very very girlish and the next day in high school we're all like fuck what was that what was that we got it you know that's the thing and so i started to really get into drums and really collecting you know singles and i would go downtown once a week to go to the dentist or orthodontist and there was record rendezvous and i'd pick up a you know an english album or whatever and you know like most people you know i i, I began to really dig into um soul and r&b not most people, but in my circle, uh, soul and R&B. And I got, a, I got a gig playing at a high school band, and it was an integrated band, which was really rare. There were two bands. I wrote a, I wrote a story about this. There were two bands at our high school. There was a, a, the Rich Kids Band, and they had parents who signed for big Vox amplifiers and, you know, PA system. And they were very cool and very hip. And they were the rich kids. And I was in the, 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 the poor kids band and we had homemade speakers and people, you know, we didn't even, I think we only had one real guitar amplifier, the uh, bass player and the other guitarist played, um, through, uh, uh, actually a PA amplifier, Bogan challenger. And, but we, we had a black lead singer. So we did a lot of soul, a lot of R and B. And because we were integrated, we could play quote unquote downtown. So, um, I, I had wild weekends, um, uh, playing for fraternity houses and, uh, just loved all that stuff. And we would play black clubs and black cotillions 
and uh, that's pretty hip for a, for a white suburban uh, teenager. And uh, I was very much a bohemian. You know, I had a subscription to Downbeat. You know, I read beat poetry and all that. I was just, you know, as weird a weirdo kid as I could be. And I loved English and I did well. I was an honors English, but didn't do so well in anything else. Um, but I was always a musician and a poet of some kind and whatever. Um, poet uh, into poetry and into reading and books and 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 subculture and Cleveland was great because Cleveland had our honest to God uh, bohemian subculture they had a great club called La Cave where all the English bands or the weirdo American bands uh, would come through you know I got to see Procol Harum and Neil Young and the Velvet Underground and um, all of that, um, fabulous stuff. Plus, they had coffee houses, though, that that uh, were on the on the touring circuit. So I got to see um, uh, folk folk players like Dave Von, Dave Von Ronk and um, um, Fred Neal, and uh, you know that whole thing. So it was really eclectic background, but always, always, always rock and roll for me. And then I, 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 I graduated and I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. And I said, well, I guess I better go to college. My parents are pressuring me. And, and my grades weren't that great. But Kent was a place you go to on weekends. And I, I went, to, I got accepted at Kent. And I couldn't bring my drums. So I bought a, 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 a guitar, a little electric guitar and started to play it. And later on, I got a bass. And later on, I did bring my drums down, but um, I began to plug into the music scene there. And um, the best band, uh, and is still, they're still going after 50 years, is 156075, the Numbers Band. And they were the big band in town. And um, I, I, I made a pest of myself. Um, jumping on stage every time they played uh, a Bo Diddley song so I could play maracas. And uh, um, eventually I was, they needed a bass player. And so I got into that. But then comes uh, something really interesting to me in terms of small uh, labels. Well, they played a show at the Cleveland Agora opening for uh, Bob Marley's first tour of the United States. They recorded it, taped it, and they stamped it up themselves. And it's called Jimmy Bell is still in town, and it is a fabulous record. It's a live record. Well, uh, they made a they printed five hundred of them, and they kind of didn't know what to do with it. And I volunteered to 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 see you know if I could flog it. <clears throat> and so I learned about the record business, trying to flog uh, um, the 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 numbers bands record, and that included you know, contacting the distributors in Cleveland and learning what a one-stop is and, you know, how do records get in stores and, you know, what is publishing and, um, uh, you know, uh, I started to read Billboard and um, began to mail copies to A&R people because I, I was a religious believer in, in the sensationalness of the numbers band. And uh, one of the copies landed on uh, the desk of uh, a woman named Karen Berg, who was a uh, uh, for Electra, and she had signed television. And we all, I love television like crazy. And I said, you know, these is, you should, you should check out our band, which is also improvisational, but coming from, um, uh, from coming from a jazz blues background. And she really dug it and uh, asked us to come to New York. But then, as soon as we're, you know, there, she, I, I'm sorry, I can't come. I'm going to be in, in um, L.A. So uh, that kind of lay dormant until the whole uh, uh, Tin Huey business, which uh, I, I eventually got fired from the numbers band because I started writing songs uh, with my friend Liam Sternberg, uh, who I connected back with. And. We began to write songs and record them at a guy named Rick Daly's house who had an eight track machine and little, you know, that's when Nick Nicholas began to do clone and all this. And I began to hang out in Akron of uh, Tin Huey would play, uh, we, uh, by the way, you know, uh, the, the gigs were in Cleveland or Kent. There was really nothing going on in Akron. Kent had a strip of bars, six, seven, eight bars. And each one had, um, 
uh, uh, live music, and uh, it might be in a genre, but the audiences were not like uh, for the, uh, uh, which was really wonderful and surprising. The audiences wanted to hear something different, and I credit the Numbers Band for like training the audience because they were very experimental, and yet you could still dance to it, hook up to it, get drunk to it. But they since they were taking uh, blues and and uh, doing a very artful improvisational jazz um, approach to the blues. Um, I think they train the audience to say, hey, I'm going to go next door and see this band, um, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, I think Bob Kidney, the leader, influenced other people to start to write because uh, the big thing about, one of the big things about Midwestern bands, and this is key, why I think so many of the successful people uh, come out of the Midwest is when you're in a Midwestern band, you play three one hour sets a night. Okay. That's a lot of material. Plus you bring your own PA at the time. So uh, people, no matter what genre, like one of the bands might be a country rock band, but the, there was incur after you've gone through, you know, playing, playing your Eagles uh, cuts or whatever. Um, it, there was, there was an encouragement to write and to present something different. And or if uh, if you're doing a cover, do it differently. Uh, plus, we had, we had people like Joe Walsh, you know, playing for 50 cents and Phil Keggy from um, uh, Glass Harp. These are masterful musicians, you know, and you go see them um, uh, and, and uh, you know, for 50 cents, you know, and 25 cent beer or whatever. Uh, it's fabulous. Uh, and again, three one hour sets where well, people began to write and um, Kent was just the best. Kent was filled with art and music and a great English department and a great th film department. So we all kind of got bit by the art bug, which very much influenced our writing. And uh, even though Kent was a very kind of rum dum uh, commuters college, teachers college, it had sensational sensational professors in those departments and little by little we all began to integrate you know that kind of knowledge and and uh, all those great art movements and whatever uh, literary movements into our writing so our writing became very eclectic and and then we would also like say nick would you know glom on to uh, you know lou reed's um erudition and uh, other other really good songwriters and all the experimental stuff that's coming from england out of canterbury like the soft machine and all that and and th you know this all and all the kraut rock stuff you know this is not what normal kids listen to but but uh, all of that was being listened to in the kent akron cleveland area and uh, uh I think I think that kind of made it one. I mean, there were other unique spots like Athens, Georgia, and all that, and um, <clears throat> and of course the whole CBGB thing. But we had our own we had our own thing going on, and you know that begat Perubu and all of that. And um, just to just to wrap this little portion up because it kind of ties everything together, um, there was a uh, a manager named Cliff Bernstein, and Cliff Bernstein and Peter Mensch were working for uh, the big uh, talent agency, rock and roll talent agency, Lieber Krebs. And uh, they left Lieber Krebs and uh, started their own company, but Cliff always had uh, um, a lot of uh, ties to uh, Polygram, uh, Polygram Records which pre universal music group. Well, um, Cliff, Cliff convinced them to give him a label, uh, a, a small budget label to, uh, experiment with some of these crazy weirdo bands that are out there that are not, not getting radio play and the mainstream stations, but, you know, certainly doing well in college and all this. So they gave him a label and it was called blank, which is right out of, you know, uh, Richard hell. Well, he signed three bands, Perubu from Cleveland, the Bizarros from Akron, and then suicide commandos from Minneapolis. So the tie in was, you know, that was two out of three of them were Cleveland, Akron, Northeastern Ohio. And of course, Bizarros being Nick Nicholas, and Peru, you know, being as arty as, as art, working class arty 
as you could possibly be. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of got, got uh, uh, that scene a little bit on the map. And, of course, Devo, who are, are, were a force of nature. And, uh, uh, again, we, we were all able to do our own self-pressings, right? You know, no one was, this was the age of DIY. So at Akron, especially, there was nothing. So you had to invent everything, you, you know, your own newspaper. You had to invent your own clubs, you had to, you know, build your own studios, whatever, which we all did. So um, <clears throat> it was very, very DIY and very uh, interesting. It's, it's, it's always that, it, at least around here, it's, it's, and in my life, it's always very working class, work oriented. Uh, this is the job, but very um, scholarly in a sense that it's, that it's, um, uh, inf informed by by European avant-garde or uh, the Dadaists, the Futurists, or the Situationalists uh, International, or uh, things like that. So it was very it was very interesting mix, and I think that permeates all the people that come out of here. I mean, Chrissy Hine, tough ass, you know, she's she's upper upper middle class. Her parents were executives. Okay, at at the rubber factories, um, you know, uh, the the guys at the bazaars. I believe their parents were were more, you know, on the shop floor. All right, and and um, you had two. You had with Perubu and Devo. You had two parallel um, uh, approaches to dealing with industrial life. You had Perubu, which champions the decay and the sounds and the clatter and uh the mechanization and uh the the at the time the decay of you know the rust belt uh, area of, of of cleveland and kind of put it to music well devo took because their parents were um uh upper class or or um up upper middle class they were more they were the executive era of um, the rubber industries and or um, in support, uh, 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 spin off support things like the mother's spouse's father ran a employment agency that would uh, find uh, executives for, do a, you know, he was a headhunter. Um, Jerry Casale's family was um, uh, 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 some kind of upper management thing. But Devo took the other approaches and were horrified and angry that these, uh, and by the way, Jerry and Mark are like, you know, off the shelf, sorry, off the scale, uh, brilliant artists and uh, writers and super, super highly educated and highly talented. So what is a highly educated, highly talented kid going to do you know, he's staring down the barrel of what? I'm going to be an executive at a rubber factory? Hardly. So their reaction was rage. And their reaction was to build literally a parallel universe where they made fun of industrialization, where they made, you know, vicious fun of 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 working class. That You know, those yellow suits, those are janitorial suits. Those are suits that um, uh, Casali at the time was uh, being the graphic designer for a janitorial supply catalog, okay? So he sees all these things like knee pads and um, uh, the uh, yellow suits and, and they, they build a mocking, a mocking uh, alternative uh, corporate structure and yeah, uh, with their own uh, lingo and, uh, kind of military um, uh, approach, almost fascist uh, approach to to art and creating of art. They they were like they mocked the they mocked the executive level, and then Perubu didn't mock, but but you know, hardly they uh, they um, celebrated in a sarcastic, twisted way the other aspect of industrialization. So I know I'm skipping out. I'm, I'm going off on all kinds of tangents, but I warned you. I warned you. No, trust me. Uh, I love uh, love hearing the story, so no warning was necessary. Um, I'd like to ask you about the Akron sound now, though. That's this term that has come to define all of the music coming out of Ohio in the late 1970s. And I've already spoken to Jane Ashley. I spoke to Nick Nicholas. Um, their music doesn't necessarily sound like one another, and your music doesn't sound like 
either of them uh, per se. Um, so it's a very eclectic scene, but but also seems like uh, you know just having spoken to them, uh, like there was a lot of unity, a lot of cohesion. Um, what was it like being a part of the Akron Sound? What does it mean uh, to have been a part of this this great fruitful uh, musical scene? See, okay, all right, you know that's that, maybe that's a press agent's term. I don't know, but I you know on one hand I want to refute it, on the other hand I want to it's useful. Yeah, it's very eclectic and it's small. Remember, this is a small scene, maybe a hundred people you know, um, doing all of this. Uh, so, uh, because it's a small, you know, in the seventies, a dying town, um, and Cleveland also obviously dying. Um, uh, there was not, there was inherent in it an eclecticism because everyone was kind of a majority of, 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 of one, you know, you had one Peru boy, you had one Tin Huey, you had, one kind of Devo. Now, I, I, I've said this before. When I was in New York, and 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 you, you notice this when you get the Village Voice. You know, let's say you want to do a rockabilly band, and um, you uh, put an ad in the paper and say, "Okay, rockabilly band forming must have look, uh, period instruments. You know, know the know the repertoire, whatever." You 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 get a hundred, two hundred people. All right, and in in Akron, especially. You had one incredible jazz guy, maybe two. Um, I'm thinking maybe three. I'm thinking Terry Hind, um, uh, Chrissy Hind's brother, uh, Alan Myers, uh, the the drummer from Devo, and uh, Ralph Carney. And Ralph Carney and Alan were were buds and roommates. And um, you had Ralph Carney, who was, uh, you know, indescribably talented musician who could play anything and everything and deep into jazz. But you had one Ralph Carney. Um, and if Ralph Carney wanted to be in a band, he would have to pl go play with somebody who might be into rockabilly and um, uh, or uh, punk rock or whatever. And so everything by its nature is very eclectic. And I'll come back to that. I need to take a break because my friend Harvey Gold from Tin Huey is here and we need to do a little paperwork. So time out. So through the magic of studio editing, we are back with Chris Butler. Um, Chris, at this time, there were a lot of uh, compilation albums being put out by various venues or various cities. Um, most notably, in New York City, you had the, the rival compilations put out by Max's Kansas City and CBGB's, um, both of which kind of missed the mark, I would say, in terms of uh, capturing the sound of the scene, whether that's because bands had already sent to major labels or just weren't available um, you know, for the record. Um, I think those albums really don't do a great job of uh, showing people what was going on in New York City at the time. Yes, the kind of B list, the B list, the uh, tough darts, you know, and and uh, and uh, the Schoitz, the the Schoitz from Brooklyn. I love that song Operatico. I even got to say Annie Golden. I really like your, I really like that song. And she was not. I, I have a bad story about everybody. I'm sorry. I've had the worst luck meeting people. I you know, influ I mean, I could tell you shit that. Oh God. <laughs> well, where I was going with that is, um, Stiff Records put out the Akron compilation in 1978. Which, at least to me, as an outsider, um, you know, several decades removed from the album, seems like it does a much better job than the two New York albums um, at capturing what was going on, boots on the ground with the scene in Akron uh, in in the late 1970s. Is that a fair assessment of that compilation album? Well, kind of, but it's a bit of a sleight of hand too, because there weren't enough bands, and so we made up bands. I mean, the waitresses were a made up band. Jane Eyre was a made up band, you know, because we were in either we had day jobs, or I was in the numbers band, and that's a full time commitment. That's a that's that band. Uh, uh, you know, we played four nights a week, and we rehearsed uh, four times a week, and there was no time for it. So the the solution that Liam and I came up with was, well, it's just a van a band, you know. And when, then we could tell lies about it, you know, because we needed we needed some vehicle for our songs because the songs we were coming up with. I mean, he was in an Elvis imitators band. They're not going to play, you know, what he wrote. And the crap I was coming up with, you know, was certainly not in a numbers band was not. This is Bob Kidney's band. I write the songs. And they frankly wouldn't have worked with the band anyway. But um, so so, you know, and, and thankfully we had two a tracks access to it. Rick Daly, who I mentioned, and then Mark Price from Teen Hue, he had an A-track machine. And interestingly, they were not, uh, formats were not compatible, but it never stopped us because if, if, if Mark was busy, we'd take our tape over to Rick's and whatever. So our, you know, our stuff really sounded weird because 
because things were not aligning quite properly technically. But uh, yes, it, it was eclectic. It was eclectic because it was small. It was eclectic because it was a bunch of individually passionate people who had to, if you wanted to be in the band, you had to be, I mean, I'm a, I was a funk R&B kid, you know, and who liked the who, that's it. Um, uh, and I was a jazzy, bluesy snob. And so, uh, and Tid Huey is very, very, very eclectic, perfect example. Um, and, but if, if Ralph Carney wanted to be in a band, he would have to, you know, play with people who are not necessarily into what he was into. That's my point about, um, the village voice ad for a rockabilly band. Um, so out of that comes, you know, how do we synthesize what everybody kind of likes and how do, if we write something, it's got to have a bit for them and a bit for them. And, and so you do come up with some, same with Peru, but you do, you know, Dave, Dave Thomas has often said, at least to me, you know, you know, yeah, Peru, you have the rockers and then the artists. You know, and I had to try and, you know, figure out, you know, glue it together so we could, you know, make something. So I think our scenes or our uniqueness came out of a bit of a small. And you, you had you had a few really passionate people into what they were, what, the, what they loved. But if you wanted to play in a band, you had to somehow not compromise, but somehow find an integrated thing that... <clears throat> that gave you a sense of I'm I'm bringing the best I can to this entity, but uh, uh, you know I'm not doing straight jazz, but I'm bringing a jazz tone to this. I'm I'm not doing funk, but I'm paying more attention to beats and rhythms. Uh, you know when when you when you try and glue when you try and write something or or solid or integrate yourself into the combo. So. Uh, I think I think that's why everybody is so eclectic, because we were we were diverse as as, as individuals. Now the music that you were putting out as the waitresses, uh, you had three songs on the uh, Akron compilation, and two of those songs were released as a seven inch on Clone Records called uh, the Waitresses in Short Stack. Um, they're very different than what people might expect from the Waitresses if they only know your later work. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it was like uh, for you when you were first? coming up with the concept of the waitresses exactly yeah well you know i was a baby songwriter so you do different kinds of things and again having access to these two a-track machines it's like wow i'm learning about recording and i can try all these different things and when you're a baby songwriter you kind of write what you write you, you can't really you know give yourself a brief to say all right i need to write a song uh that has a funk beat and you know, you can kind of uh, give yourself parameters, but when you're writing, it's like, wow, there's a song, you know, you know, whatever. Um, Clones was fun because I was, uh, you know, it did as much experimental crap and banging on pots and pans as possible. I love Little Feet. So slide the other side, you know, I want to do a song with a slide guitar. And, and, um, uh, because it was an imaginary band, you could pick and choose people amongst your small circle to, like Michael Aylward's play a slide guitar from Tin Huey, and he's a monster slide player, not in a traditional, you know, Lowell George or, or Dwayne Allman. He's more of a noisemaker. He loves experimental shit. So, so, so here's, you know, he's, he's contributing his oeuvre and Ralph doing my sax solos, you know, I mean, how could you can't do any better than that? for I know what boys like. And um, uh, I'm playing all the other instruments as best I can, playing bass and playing guitar, a one-fingered uh, keyboard, but the one-finger Farfisa goes through all these little cheap electronic effects, so it sounds like a, a synthesizer. So we had the wonderful thing, one of the wonderful things about Akron is nobody gave a damn. You know, nobody said no. Um, so if no one's interested, we can do whatever you want. You know, uh, because now, you know, Clive Davis or whatever was not going to come, you know, and check out your band. And, you know, there's no hope. You know, we were no hopers. So what the fuck? Do do whatever it is you want to do and have fun and do all this, which gets back to your early question. What was the interaction and in scenes like? Well, everybody's kind of friendly and lending equipment. And, you know, uh, because there were the two recording areas, you know, Dave Thomas and Ralph Carney would come down to Mark Price's house to record something. And um, Rick Daly would work with DeVoe. 
uh, and do uh, demos or whatever at, at his studio. And we would, uh, you know, Human Switchboard was in Kent. They had a record store. Uh, every once in a while, there would be a, a um, very often, like it would be Perubu, Tin Huey, Human Switchboard. Um, so Akron Kent on the, uh, on the bill. So we would share the bill. There was really no place to play in Akron until... Um, uh, Rubber City Rebels and Dead uh, uh, Rubber City Rebels took over, and Devo took over this dump called the Crypt, and uh, they started a punk club or an experimental club or whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, so that became a thing. But again, you know, most of the gigs were in Kent, and <clears throat> uh, uh, the club owners began to take a shot at some of these weirdo bands and. Um, getting, you know, again, we're blessed with an audience that liked something different and something new. So as long as they could sell beer, you know, they were cool with whatever the hell noise we were making. So uh, it was a, it was a nice scene. It was a supportive scene until of course, somebody gets signed. And then all of a sudden, why, then the why me starts, why, or why not me starts. And then you leave town like Devo right away, L.A., because they, they had huge ambitions. They wanted to make films. They wanted to make movies. You know, if you want to build cars, you got to go to Detroit. If you want to make movies, you got to go to L.A. Um, or New York. If you want to be, you know, an artsy fartsy musician, where I went, wound up, and where all of Tin Huey decamped actually after the Warner Brothers uh, experience, all of Tin Huey moved to the New York area. So now that move to New York must have been culture shock for you because you talk about how there's only maybe a hundred people in the scene in Akron, and then you go to New York and there's exponentially more people in every conceivable genre. Um, New York was really the hotbed of music, uh, you know, then as now. Um, what was that like for you uh, to come from Akron to New York at, at such a critical time in the city's history? It was rocket. There's a wonderful book called by Will Hermes called Love Goes to Buildings on Fire. And he chronicles uh, CBGB scene, um, hip hop scene and Latin music. And both were peaking like crazy. And also the loft jazz scene which is i moved there as much for that as as for rock and roll because new york was never a rock and roll town new york was an eth either an ethnic music um until cbgb um uh i mean little young rascals they're from they're from new jersey you know they claim to be a new york band but you know things like that the only one i could think of is love and spoonful really and and, and but they you know came out of the folk folk tradition so for you as an artist, there must have been a lot of cross-pollination because you had so many different uh, musical styles and artistic styles in general, um, and so much of it was visceral coming from the same place. Uh, what, what was that like for you um, just creatively being surrounded by so many different sounds? Huge, huge cross-pollination because you also had, you know, this was the era where you had dance clubs, and dance clubs still had DJs, not not as we see DJs, they were record spinners and, and they were the, um, the gatekeepers. A lot of the time, uh, they were the folks that you, uh, uh, counted on to, you know, dig in and find something new. And, uh, again, you had, yes, cross pollinization like crazy. You, you began to bring, you know, uh, at the dance clubs, you would, you would have a rock band, uh, you would have, uh, you know, Grandmaster Flash. You'd have all these this wonderful stuff coming from um, uh, from England because there was an exchange between the um, uh, particularly one one Booker and I'm thinking of the club Hurrah. Um, uh, a perfect example. You had a crossover between between uh, uh, and the Booker was uh, uh, Jim Ferrat, who was very uh, a street. Uh, gay activist, uh, very much into uh, new music and um, gay, the gay scene being very, very eclectic, not just dance, not just voguing, but also uh, uh, very uh, uh, Klaus Nomi and, and a very interesting experimental Bowie-ish type thing. So you had, yeah, this wonderful soup. And I moved there in October 79 and um, 
boy, it was right in the middle of, I could go for five bucks and get a warm Budweiser and see, you know, these incredible jazz musicians at a loft or another five bucks and get a warm, you know, uh, 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 Budweiser and see this woman named Lori Anderson doing, you know, inventing performance uh, 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 art. Or you could go to Central Park and the kids were breakdancing and a DJ had come down from the Bronx and they were really good at tapping into the uh, a lighting pole to get electricity for their sound system. You know, so you go to Central Park, you see breakdancing and these guys with, uh, you know, cutting and scratching uh, with turntables it was, it was, and Latin music. Man, there were two or three Latin stations that are just incredible. So this is what the same time when New York's in the shitter, right? This is when, when it's broke and, you know, uh, dropped dead from... Gerald Ford, the headline says, you know, uh, uh, New York's uh, 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 in the 70s was 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 um, poor and broke. And but boy, the scene was fabulous. And I just had a, I just sucked it all up. And um, I had a, I had an acetate after I had an acetate of I Know What Boys Like. And I took it to a DJ named named Mark Kamen's. And Mark Camus was spinning at Danceteria. And I humbly said, could you, you know, give me a shot and I'll put this on. And he played it and the crowd went, loved it. And he, said, and he played it several times that night. And then he said, can I keep it? And uh, I said, oh, okay. I was a little nervous because I think it was my only acetate. And he, the next day I got a call because he's up at the office at Island Records. And they said, can you come into the office? Uh, we want to talk to you about this song because Mark Caymans had gone to uh, Island Antilles and said, um, I want a job in A&R because I can find you things like this. And uh, I went up to the office. And they said, we want to sign you for a single. Uh, where's your band? Because we need a B-side. Uh, 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 Ben's in Ohio. Uh, you know, I said, all right, get something together. We need a B-side. Well, here I am in the middle of all this scene, and I asked friends, who are the hippest band? What's the hippest band in town? And they said, the Contortions. Uh, they just broke up, though. They just broke up. Um, and I, a friend of a friend said, well, the guitarist, Pat Place, she takes tickets at Bleecker Street Cinema. She's in the box office. So I went to the box office and I said, wow, you know, nice to meet you. I, I, I got your records and I'm looking to put some musicians together because I need to record a B-side for a song. And she gave me uh, members who were in the contortions. She gave me Dave, uh, Dave Hofstra for bass, um, Jody Harris for guitar, and Don Christensen for drums. And uh, Jody wasn't available, but Don was and Dave was. And I, I, I wrote a song called No Guilt, and uh, Ralph was there. So that's kind of how The Waitresses transformed from the abstract concept uh, that you had created in Ohio to a fully-fledged band? Well, uh, sort of, at the time, yeah. So uh, Donnie had, thankfully, had a loft uh, where you could make noise. So we, I read the song called No Guilt, Patty came to New York. She was, uh, you know, she would she would go to was uh, can't say it was on the quarter system, so she would go to school for a quarter, take a quarter off, go work somewhere, make some money, usually as a waitress, or go travel. And she said, eh, "Yeah, what the hell? I'm coming to New York. Coming to New York. Uh, got Ralph Carney who had decamped and living in Brooklyn, and Dan Clayman who came from Akron um, as well on keyboards and." Dave Hofstra on bass and um, uh, Donnie and uh, uh, we recorded uh, the flip side, uh, No Guilt. And um, <clears throat> uh, but Patty decided to stick around and uh, OK, so they released the single and it did really, really well. And they said, well, maybe we want to do an album. And, and, and I asked Patty was, you know, uh, 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 Dave Hofstra kind of he was a jazz player, but he played bass for the hell of it, a rock uh, bass for the hell of it. Don Christensen wanted to, with Jody Harris, wanted to start, and Pat Irwin, another Midwesterner. Oh, by the way, these are all Midwesterners. They're from Nebraska. They're from uh, Kansas. 
uh, Ohio. Um, again, the training was three one-hour sets, four nights a week. So these were all really good players, much better than New York players. Um, really, because think about it. If you're, you know, I'm going to move to the big city, you know, I'm going to move to New York. I better, I better have my chops up. And so all these, you know, these are really good musicians. Um, uh, the Patty, uh, you know, they want to make an album. You, you know, should we make this fake band real? And she said, Yeah, what the hell? You know, nothing's good on, nothing's very good on TV tonight. Let's do something. So our 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 debut was with Hofstra and Donnie Christensen, and um, uh, Ralph decided to go do something else, but he turned me on to his friend Mars Williams. Mars Williams at the time was up at the um, uh, Creative Music Studio, and he was Anthony Braxton's copyist. He would do orchestrations, because this was pre-computers, where you could you know, do all orchestration on, on, um, on a, 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 a workstation. He had to do it by hand, so he's super skilled, right? Um, and we had another woman who was Patty's friend, because Patty was a little nervous about being, I, she'd never been on stage before. You know, she did a, made a couple of recordings, that's it. Um, uh, Ariel Warner as a backup singer, and uh, Clayman was there, and he was all up for it. And we debuted at Little Club 57, which was a wonderful performance uh, theme place, a uh, small club, on January 3rd, 1981, and uh, we had a set worth of material by then, and uh, you know, began to do some shows. Uh, Dave Hofstra decided that he wanted to uh, play acoustic bass and focus on jazz. Don Christensen and Jody and Irwin decided they were really going to give the Ray Beats, the surf band, their surf band, uh, um, a start. And so I went and contacted Billy Ficka, who I had met um, when Tin Huey had opened for television at the bottom line, six shows. The last turnout, that was when their first breakup. It was, what a treat, man. Two shows a night, three nights. Um, and Ficka said, yeah, I'm in. And our friend found Tracy walking down the street literally with a gig bag and said, my friend is a bass player. So that became Waitresses 2.0. And uh, we went on to do the record and whatever. That's kind of how that, so we made a real band out of a concept. <laughs> While in New York, the Waitresses were on Z Records, a very cutting edge, um, very hip record label that put out some of my favorite releases of all time, including the first Waitresses album. Um, so I, I would love to know how that came to be, and also it was while on Z that you released one of uh, your most enduring songs, Christmas Wrapping, which uh, it's, it's impossible to avoid every holiday season on the radio. So can you talk a little bit about that period of uh, the band's career? Yeah, Michael loved what he loved. And he initially had said, you know, dance music, but with a, you know, dark twist or you know, Lizzie Mercier, uh, um, Mercier de Croix. Um, uh, you know, experimental French artist. That's the E of Z E, Michael Esteban, right? French, the French end of it. And um, they did what they wanted to do. They did, you know, what they liked uh, with a kind of disco uh, sheen. Uh, except us, we were, you know, we from Ohio. We smell like manure. You know, nothing cool, nothing cool about us. I, and suicide is about as extreme as you can get, right? Um, but yeah, in 81, Michael said, well, we want, okay. Our contract got traded, so to speak from Antilles, uh, to, um, Z. That's how we wound up there. And we had recorded our album, but Z was, had lost its distribution and we were on the road trying to flog. Cause I know what boys, you know, so many records go, psh, psh, but ours went, pfft. And it just stood there, and it just kept going, which was wonderful um, in terms of, okay, let's go out and play every college town that has a college radio station that's playing us. So we're doing all this. And um, in you know, August or August of 81, Michael says, oh, I think I should, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a Christmas album with, our, uh, with all our bands? And I thought, man, I, you know, 
I don't have time for this. And you got to humor the record company and maybe you'll forget about it. So we're back on the road. Finally, we you know, go back into town and into New York. And he says, I booked you into Electric Lady in two weeks to record your Christmas song. <laughs> Shit. Okay. You know, find something and put it together. And, and we went to uh, Electric Lady, which was fabulous. And, you know, wow top shelf studio and met our good friend who's still my friend a wonderful engineer named michael uh, frondelli and we recorded it and we forgot about it and finally uh uh, uh our, our 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 record got bought by uh, polygram through karen berg who had signed who had received the numbers band record who had signed um tin huey and who wanted to sign waitresses but could not uh, uh, because she had made her quarterly quota. And she suggested I contact, well, she put me in touch with her friend, Jerry Jaffe, at Polygram. So that's how we wound up on Polygram. And Polygram bought out Z's contract and the album and asked me, mm, do you have anything else? You know, are you sure you got everything besides this album? And I swear I was honest and I said, no, no. I we had completely forgotten about this stupid Christmas song, and then Ziggy Cup puts out the Christmas record. And I, I had to apologize to Jerry Jaffe, our and our guy, and say, I mean, I, honest to God, I, we thought this was a, a throwaway, and I had no idea. And so he was grumbling because he had to go then to Ze and license it for Polygram. So that's how it wound up on Polygram. And, um, you know, it, it, it kind of took off. It started first in Boston and then there was a, oh, gosh, I used to remember the call letters of that station. I'm sorry. NCR maybe. No, that's, um, and there was a station in Washington DC that, uh, uh, liked it and they played it and then, and then it began to be, you know, up there for a time with, you know, Bruce Springsteen, Santa Claus is coming to town and all the, you know, Little Drummer Boy by David Bowie and Bing Crosby and all that. So it, you know, it 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 it, it caught on for a couple of years and then it died. It was dormant for like 10 or 15 years and then it was kind of rediscovered and now it's all over the place. And it's funny because I'm in the middle of relearning it because I, I uh, my publisher said, you know, why don't you do a, a backing track of it um, uh, so you own the master because I don't own the master. Uh, Polygram does. And, um, uh, when, when they pitch it for TV or commercials, it's Polygram that gets the master use fee. And it said, Chris, if you, you know, if you owned a copy, we, you know, a version, we would at least have an alternative, a sound alike version. And I thought, well, why don't I just buy a karaoke version? But, you know, most of them are, are all digital and all this. And they sound okay, but it's it's a karaoke thing. So I'm in the process of organizing, which I uh, have to run after after this, go into my studio and work on a um, relearn the damn song and uh, uh, make a click track because we, we need to record uh, to a click track. So, uh, and play, I have to play my glockenspiel part. <laughs> now, to somewhat change gears for a second, you produced a 7-inch in 1980 um, by a band called Art, the only band in the world. The 7-inch was called The Only Record in the World, and it was released on the only label in the world. I've listened to this. It is bizarre. Um, it's one of the few things that I, no matter how many times I play it, I truly can't figure it out. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that uh, project was like, uh, your involvement in it, and and just what art the only band in the world even was? Ah, well, Little Club Fifty Seven was this wonderful one. Every night they had a different theme. It was Playboy Playboy Lounge, or it was you know because these were all boho you know downtown kids, and nobody was you know went to their fucking high school prom so they would have a high school prom you know or they would have a wedding fake wedding you know uh, all the women who never wanted to get married but or the, were lesbians or whatever you know get a wedding dress and come out we'll, you know we'll have a wedding a wedding uh, a reception you know it's just and it was run by Anne Magnuson who uh, went on to be 
quite the movie star. And her staff was, this, you know, the sets for, because there would be plays or whatever, the art in the sets, Keith Haring, uh, the guy who showed movies on Tuesday movie nights, Jim Jarmish. You know, um, it was wonderful, wonderful. And that's where our waitresses debuted. Well, art was there. And art was, you know, it just, it, it was as New York as you could get. You had this guy from Long Island who basically yelled at you and um, did these uh, topical political punkish songs. And his thing was to always have a different, he had tearaway t-shirts. So he, he, he'd he start, he, 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 you know, at the beginning of the set, he would kind of look like Ali Oop, you know, with a little head and all this all this, this, you know, but, he, but each song had a terror or when he come to a lyric, it had a, you know, a, a topical or a T-shirt. And then they had a, a terrible guitarist, terrible guitarist. And then a woman who could sing, who played metronome. And then um, a woman who signed Lori Montana. And they were, they, I just, it was hysterical. It was perfect. It was crazy and wonderful. And, um, but they said they wanted to make a record, and I said okay. And I'll, you know, wanted me to produce, and I said okay. Uh, uh, and then they said, you know, but we don't have much money, so we want to press something that has a lot of material on it. But, but, um, you know, how could we do that? You know, because you can only get out of uh, <clears throat> out of forty five, you only get about seven and seven minutes of before our audio really becomes compromised. And I thought, well, how about if we put, <laughs> how if we split the stereo and have one song on one side and one song on the other, and all you had to do was, you know, turn your balance control if you want to hear one song or unplug your speaker if you want to hear that song and, and um, you know, or vice versa if you want to hear the one on the other track. So <laughs> that was our prank. And, uh, it, it, you know, that was just hysterical. It was a lot of fun. And there were a lot of extra for, like, crowd shouting. There were all these, you know, downtown characters. And Lori played bass in, in a wonderful, again, type community. And Magnuson's uh, band, Paul Salama. And it was all-girl all girl band doing these wonderful satirical songs and and um you know it was quite a show of these wild women and uh uh small circle but uh <clears throat> that's that's the art and i'm still friends with michael board he's crazy but it, it's wonderful in fact through michael board I, I i met a lot of my european friends um jens name from denmark and uh other other folks so uh, i'm grateful to them for uh, uh, and to art and and Crackers, the guitar player, Bill Shore, ran uh, a major rec uh, record store on St. Mark Street for years and years. And you know he was this terrible, terrible guitarist, but he had this 1962 mint Stratocaster, you know. And I kept saying, you know, that, that, that Crackers, you, you 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 don't deserve that guitar. He goes. Yeah, but I'm never gonna sell it to you. You know, and I every time, you know, I apparently he did finally sell it for like you know, uh, hundred thousand dollars or something. You know, shit. You know. Um, anyway, yeah, art, wonderful. Chris, this has been fantastic. I would love to keep the conversation going though. If you could spare another hour or so, uh, maybe next week, I'd I'd love to talk again. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it, and I can't wait until uh, until the next time we're able to speak. To be, uh, to be continued. That does it for part one of my interview with Chris Butler from The Waitresses. Um, I'm going to save my concluding thoughts on The Waitresses as well as my concluding thoughts on the Akron sound in general uh, until part two. So that does it for this episode of the Lost Labels podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Charles Epting. Thanks a lot for listening. Mm -hmm.